Madam, the story of the Singapore Malay Muslim community is a mix of pain and joy. When we hear of young Malay families struggling to make ends meet and find permanent housing, we despair at how things have gone awry for them. We tend to attribute these predicaments to many factors, which of late include the government not doing enough. Then when we see successes in our community, be it in education, sports, music, career or business, we rejoice in, this, we rejoice in these achievements. We also tend to forget that the government has nurtured and continues to ensure the ecosystem that allows those willing to work hard to succeed regardless of background. So for example, outstanding madrasa students are able to enter our internationally ranked universities because admission is based on merit and no, not where one comes from. Some would choose to paint a picture of stubborn gaps and hopelessness for our community. Madam, I would rebut this firmly. Our narrative is a mosaic of hope, opportunities and challenges that we have fought wholeheartedly and together to overcome. Through the hard work of our early pioneers and leaders in partnership with our government, we, we have been able to tackle the different problems we face and steadily move our community forward within the Singapore system. It is because this government is committed to developing the full potential of all Singaporeans that the Malay Muslim community has been able to progress this far in many areas including education and employment. The Singapore model of multiracialism and meritocracy has worked well. We take pride in working together and succeeding together while showing compassion for the less fortunate. To portray our community singularly as lagging and struggling is a dangerous attempt to lead us astray. The data we have speaks volumes. Every year we see more Malay, student, more Malay Muslim students receiving awards such as those given up by Mandaki for outstanding performance at national examinations. Household incomes have risen. There's an increase in Malay Muslim PMETs from 7.2% in 1980 to 27.8% in 2010. When I visited Lucasfilm Singapore in October, I asked them where they get the talent to keep the company at the leading edge globally. The management told me that it is indeed difficult as such talent is hard to come by even as they search across the world. But they did, but they did come across one local student who came through the polytechnic and took them by surprise. I asked for the student's background, which I got later. He is Nur Azman bin Muhammad Rahman, completed his O-levels at Pingyi Secondary School before going to Singapore Polytechnic, found time to dabble in web design and videography, did many projects on his own accord, went through a rigorous Jedi Academy internship that was itself hard to get in, and got in amidst very tough competition. I checked with Mandaki, and they found out he was a Mandaki Award recipient in 2006. Today, he is with Lucasfilm, armed with a second degree, second honors degree from NTU in fine arts, digital animation. Nor Azman is one reason why I've asked Mandaki to think of a talent management framework for our community. The point I also want to make is this, that the system from Pingyi Secondary School, Singapore Polytechnic, and NTU, and the employers who offer him internship and assignments all spurred him on and helped create a talent that Lucasfilm is proud to mention. Madam, last month I visited Singpost to launch a staff program. I wanted to know about the company, how the company develops its staff, and I learned of Mr. Abdul Rashid Mawi. Mr. Abdul Rashid joined Singpost as a career in 2001 with O-levels. He worked hard and rose through the ranks. Today, he is an assistant manager managing two Speedpost teams. He also has a diploma. He is an example of our people who work hard at upgrading themselves, even those who started humbly. There are many more stories of students and workers doing well and of families who, despite financial constraints, are able to provide a home and education for their children. They form a growing Malay Muslim middle class, which we should be proud of, and look to for support for those further behind. The Singaporean Malay Muslim community does not shy away from challenges and has a strong desire to do better. We have progressed tremendously by working in partnership with our government and seizing opportunities available to every Singaporean without special treatment. This evolutionary process has made it possible for us to innovate and progress. We cannot, in good conscience, ignore our history of community efforts and government assistance just for the self-serving agenda of a few. And we will continue on this path with improvements in the working relationship between the government and the community. My colleagues and I, together with our community leaders, are committed to this path. There will always be an open invitation for each and everyone within the community and beyond to work together 
on the next phase of our journey towards a community of excellence. Madam, I can sense a growing appetite for a more all-encompassing definition of success. Many have found their niches in different areas. More are in the process of discovering their passions and interests. Dr. Mohamed Fazal Ibrahim pointed out that our community is young and there are many talents among us. Some have made it a name for themselves locally and abroad in, varied, in various fields. I have cited Nora Azman and Lucas Film. There is Misara Ismail, a member of a local multiracial indie band called Sera, making her unique imprint on our local cultural landscape. We also have Ustaz Nasruddin Nase, a bright young Muslim scholar who is doing his PhD at Oxford University, and Ms. Alfian Yashrif Kuchit, who went to Columbia Law School and is currently Shara Scott's youngest president. These are encouraging developments. Indeed, the nurturing of talent must be our community next key phase of ethos to embrace. We should support those who are ex excelling to their fullest potential and give the hidden gems an opportunity to shine. There are existing talent development programs for the community to tap on. For example, Mundaki's Go Choktong Youth Promise Award is designed for talents beyond the academic field, while the Rizwan Zafi Community Awards is for promising professionals in the public and social service sectors. Beside these programs, there is always room to broaden what we can offer to the widening talent spectrum. Mandaki is now exploring relevant pilot schemes. Project Prodigy is one initiative worth highlighting as it gives emerging talent the rare opportunity to learn from established icons in our community, such as music com composer Iskandar Mirza and dancer Som Said. Under Mr. Iskandar's mentorship, Rizan Yusuf, 21 years old, has grown remarkably as a musician. Going forward, Mandaki will work even more closely with families, schools, and the community to draw out the varied strengths of individuals. We welcome ideas on how we can do this, we can do this well. On the social religious front, the Islamic Religious Council of Singapore, MUIS, plans to step up its grooming of outstanding students, young asatizas or religious teachers, and graduates into specialists who are able to provide progressive religious guidance. Already, we are seeing more of such individuals scaling peaks of academic excellence in their desire to serve our community better. And this includes Ustaza Raihana Halid, who had completed her Master's in the Principles of Islamic Jurisprudence at the, Islamic, at the International Islamic University of Malaysia. She was recently sponsored by MUIS to do her Master's of Law at NUS. This would no doubt add greater value to her work at the Office of the Mufti from both Islamic and secular vantage points. It is commendable that these individuals have the thirst for knowledge, not just for personal development, but also to be of greater service to our community. Moise's strategy of incubating these specialists will complement other efforts to shape a progressive Singaporean Muslim community. And this includes the Joint Madrasa System of the JMS, which aims to produce our religious leaders, and a life or living Islamic values everyday programs that offer modular, contextualized religious education for our community. Madam, education should remain a priority for the community as it is a key leveler. The motivation to do well in school has borne fruit for many Malay Muslim students, some of whom have persevered despite personal setbacks. Everyone has a part to play to make sure that our young receive quality education starting from preschool. I therefore urge Malay Muslim preschool operators to embrace this year's budget initiatives to develop good teachers and be located closer to our homes and workplaces. Mandaki has been tirelessly enhancing its tuition scheme, or MTS, to facilitate optimal learning. To address Mr. Zaduni's query, Mandaki places great emphasis on ensuring sufficient resources for the tuition scheme. Tutors are selected through a rigorous selection process, and they undergo regular training to keep abreast with the latest curriculum. New MTS initiatives focused on strengthening students' thinking and inquiry skills will also be implemented this year. In pilot classes at upper primary levels, facilitators will cater to students' different learning styles to help them make better sense of science concept. Since MTS enhancements were introduced in 2012, enrollment has increased by about 20%. MTS now has more than 9,000 students, thanks to support from 69 schools, five community centers, and one mosque in hosting tuition centers. Mandaki will also bring on board Malay Muslim organizations, or MMOs, and the Malay Activity Executive Committees, or the MEECs, to reach a total of 12,000 students. Beyond the MTS, Mandaki will launch Sense College in Tampines, a skill center for learning and upgrading. 
Through its bridging program, Sense College offers students a second chance to obtain qualification such as the N, O, and A levels. Mr. Mohamed Faisal Manap asked about the extension of the tertiary tuition fee subsidy scheme. Students of mixed parentage are eligible to apply for the TTFS if his or her race or the first component of the double barrel race as stated in NRC is Malay. This means that a Malay student, sorry, a Malay slash Indian student qualifies for the TTFS provided he or she also meets the other eligible criteria such as the monthly household income, monthly gross household per capita income or PCI cap. Madam, the TTFS is a government scheme for students studying locally at the polytechnics and as undergraduates in our universities. There are other forms of financial assistance for eligible postgraduate students, such as the Mandaki Study Loan Full-Time Scheme. Education outside of the classroom is equally important in shaping the character of our youth. As announced in the budget, there will be greater government support for school-based student care centres. Existing providers such as AMP will certainly benefit from this support. Mandaki Sense is also making, uh, playing its part by setting up its first centre at Blanga Rice Primary School this year. Programs at the centre will include social and emotional learning to help our students acquire fundamental life skills and a dedicated officer to support children with learning disabilities. With more of such centres, I believe mothers will have the peace of mind to re-enter the workforce while entrusting their children to qualified practitioners. Madam Moss are a key institution of our community's social religious life. We should be proud of our community's successful Moss building efforts. Building on this legacy, our mosques are evolving to meet our changing needs. Apart from being a place of worship, our mosques are a well-established provider of religious education. It is at the mosques that many of us learn about Islam and its application to our daily lives. Madrasas are the other key religious institution we should continue to focus on. Our madrasas are not an alternative to mainstream national schools. Their key priority is to produce qualified religious teachers we are able to meet the changing expectations and needs of our community. They will produce religious leadership that will help our community develop together as good Singapore Muslims by ensuring our social religious compass is in the right direction. I am proud that our madrasa students have done well. At the primary level, Madrasa Irshad has been continuously surpassing the PSLE benchmark score. Many Madrasa Al Arabiya graduates have furthered their studies in fields from engineering to biomedical sciences after attaining good O-level results. About 70% of Madrasa al junior graduates go on to pursue religious studies at the world-famous Al-Azhar University in Cairo and other tertiary institutions in the Middle East. MUIS has spared no effort in reviewing the Madrasa curriculum under the joint Madrasa system of the GMS. So I'd like to assure Dr. Intan that the new multidisciplinary and integrated GMS curriculum reflects a major paradigm shift in our, religious, in our Madrasa education. It is designed to develop future asatizas and ulama or religious scholars who are well-versed in both Islamic and academic sciences so that they are able to make sound decisions when tackling multifaceted issues. We must not let up in our drive for a top quality madrasa education system. MUIS has made significant strides in this respect with the new International Baccalaureate Diploma Program or IBDP teacher development and student management program in the works. The IBDP in particular will be a breakthrough in integrating academic and religious learning and MUIS is working through the implement implementation details of this major move. Achieving our vision, of course, will take resources. We have to be prepared to invest more in building up our madrasas and I seek parents' understanding in helping to bear this. MUIS will also step up its share by increasing funding to full-time madrasa and financial assistance to needy students. Pulling together our resources has always been a hallmark of our community, from Zakat to the Mosque Building and Mandaki Fund, or MBMF, and Wakaf Ilmu, and I ask for the com community's continued support in these efforts. Dr. Mohamed Faisal Ibrahim asked about part-time religious education for working adults. Leveraging on the positive feedback on our life, MUIS has piloted the Adult Islamic Education Program, or ADIL, in six malls and attracted more than 300 sign-ups so far. Classes are offered both in English and Malay, which tailors to the needs of our young urban professionals. MUIS will keep improving our life on our deal and make religious education for the entire community more student-centric and relevant. We will continue to ensure that our malls serve our community well. So to address Mr. Hawaz's query, 
The accelerated MOS upgrading program or MUP phase two from 2012 to 2016 is on track. A total of 16 projects have been identified, seven MOS for major upgrading and nine MOS for minor upgrading. Works are, beginning to, are expected to begin in the third quarter of this year for most MOS in the latter category. Jamea Rabita MOS in Tiong Baru will be the first MOS under the MUP phase two to greet congregants with a fresh look later this year. Our plans for three new mosques at Pongo, Jurong West and Woodlands are progressing well. I recently unveiled the design concept for Pongo Mosque, which will be ready in 2015. Madam, this is the first time that the Mosque Design Review Committee makes recommendations on mosque design. We are now studying public feedback and will see the final design at a groundbreaking ceremony later this year. The Jurong West and Woodlands Mosques are in the pipeline to be located near the junction of Jalan Baha and Jurong West Avenue 2 the Jurong West Mosque is expected to be completed in 2016 and the new mosque in Woodlands to be, re to be located sorry, along the future extension of Woodlands Drive 17 will also be ready in 2016. Madam, 2012 was a challenging year as we faced external uncertainties that affected how we usually conducted Korban and Haji uh, and fulfill our Hajj requirements. These are stark reminders that there will always be factors beyond our control and we cannot afford to take for granted our privilege of being able to lead our religious lives well. The key is to work together as a community to find sustainable solutions to conduct our social religious life while keeping pace with circumstances beyond our control. I'm happy that we have taken these changes in our stride. Mr. Hawazi is concerned about how we can better allocate the Hajj visas. Our official Hajj quota is 680 per year. Noting how well organized our pilgrims and our pilgrim management system are, the Saudi government had offered 1,500 additional places each year between 2008 and 2011. However, Madam, in view of the various developments in Mecca and Medina, the Saudi government has since decided to limit all countries to their official quota for the safety of all pilgrims. Hence, it is not likely that we can get additional visas above our official quota. To manage local demand, MUIS will implement changes to our Hajj registration policy, having looked at the issues very, very carefully. As Hajj is obligatory only once in a lifetime for every Muslim who can afford to do so, we must therefore give priority to first-time applicants. Those who have performed Hajj before, or repeaters, may only do so again at least 10 years after their previous time. Each year, there will also be a 10% cap on repeaters based on the revised policy we will inform all affected applicants of the new allocated Hajj year. Mr. Housley noted a Korban Review Committee comprising representatives from the AVA, MCCY, MUIS, and the Singapore Mosque Korban Committee, or the JKMS, has been formed to review the supply of livestock for Korban in Singapore. Madam, this is in response to the new Australian regulatory requirements, which our 16 mosques offering Korban have had professionally complied with last year. The committee will continue to work with the Australian authorities to secure the livestock. But as a contingency plan, the committee is also exploring alternative sources. The main considerations are they have to meet the required health criteria and of course be of reasonable cost. So I seek our community's patience as the feasibility study is ongoing. Mr. Hawazi has raised an interesting suggestion to utilize Waka funds to set up a sheep farm to meet our needs for Kurban. However, our Wakaf funds are disbursed strictly according to the Wakaf's will or indenture for specific purposes such as education and mosque building. Madam, I believe the supply of livestock is best left to private sector providers who are able to meet the necessary requirements. With other global uncertainties, the committee should think of new ideas to address existing challenges and plan ahead. It is important that we continue to engage and participate in conversations on issues that are pertinent to us. The Independent Committee on the Engagement of the Malay Muslim Community, or Swara Mushwara, is playing an important role in bringing together the community's suggestions and recommendations. To address Mr. Zano's query, on the, the committee has listened to more than 200 people from all walks of life and over some 20 focus group discussions. So I understand one major theme so far is how we can foster an inclusive society with a strong, gotong growing spirit. I'm glad that some participants have pointed out that the opportunities are open to all Singaporeans, including Malay Muslims. To them, what matters is seizing such oppor opportunities to pursue their dreams and lend a hand to the less fortunate among us. Going forward, we can expect more candid sharing 
And I believe this is a journey for our community to put our heads together to create a better home for all. I'm looking forward to the committee's final report as a roadmap to chart our future together. Madam Dr. Muhammad Maliki asked if there's scope to provide services in other neighbourhoods similar to the Mandaki's pilot enhanced wraparound care or EWAC project in McPherson. Madam, I'm pleased to announce that Mandaki at the Heartlands will be set up in Pasiris and Woodlands. These satellite centres will help needy families gain access to a broad range of social services near their homes. I encourage the centre's clients to be open and forthcoming about their circumstances and concerns so that the right solutions can be found for them. Madam, our community is now in the next phase of our journey towards excellence. Singapore is tuned for success and I urge our community to make the most of the diverse opportunities that our government works tirelessly to create. Where needed, we will ensure that help is always given, like for education and training through Mandaki's many initiatives. The doors of our social religious institutions will always be open, and where possible, we will provide springboards for our bright sparks to reach greater heights. We must set our sights far and scale new peaks along the way. Allowing a misplaced narrative of hopelessness perpetuates the very stereotype that we have worked hard over many decades to dispel. We must not be our worst enemy by getting trapped into a negative, self-fulfilling prophecy. I recall that Mandaki's recent dialogue on the population white paper, a young man stood up towards the end. Mr. Muhammad Ibn Rashad, the co-founder of Sustainable Living Lab, the innovative arm of a community-oriented organization called Ground Up Initiative, told the older gentleman at the dialogue, and I quote, that we must find the courage to leave our baggage behind. It is a whole new world out there with many, many opportunities. If we continue to be preoccupied with what could have been, we miss out on what can be. Close quote. Madam, I took his message to heart. This is the crux of where we are today. Our story is a mosaic of courage and fortitude, where individuals take pride in what they do and together move our community forward. I'm encouraged by the spirit of this man and woman I have met. Like fellow Singaporeans, they steadfastly overcome the odds through hard work and it is on the backs of their efforts that this country has grown to where we are today. It is only by working together, government, community leaders and families, and like-minded partners, that we will continue to lift up our community tier by tier. 